Hi, my name is Alexa, and this is That Wrestling Lunch. I am here to wrestle tonight. This is not a comedy routine. This is not uh, a skit, okay? This is real. I am here to wrestle a woman, okay? I am here to wrestle up to three or four women, maybe. I'm not here just to, uh, just three women who just come out of the audience. I want to see Notwithstanding your bravado, do you feel a hostage? Do you feel like you're a hostage in your own home tonight? Fuck! Steve is a dead man walking because when Austin 316... Meets Pillman. Oh my God! Nine millimeter oh clock. Oh my God! I'm gonna blow his sorry ass he's out straight there, to hell. He's a Steve Austin. Second thing, if you got a fight in public, <laughs> if you lost, you got fired. That's Bobby Orton Jr. Keeping and maintaining the illusion has historically been very important to those who work in professional wrestling. In an industry consistently bogged down for not being quote-unquote real, there have always been certain protocols in place to maintain characters and the fantasy. But to say that because kayfabe is utilized to maintain that fantasy that wrestling is therefore fake is to greatly misunderstand the industry of professional wrestling. Any wrestling fan knows that people live, breathe, and die this business, and none of the maneuvers, stunts, or blood is fake. And it really seems that if you don't like wrestling or have someone in your life that does, it's a widely unknown truth. The amount I have talked with people for a while, and then when I tell them I, in part, write about wrestling as work, they'll say, well, it's fake, so what are you really writing about? Then the spiel comes and they regret ever opening their mouth in the first place because I get to the point that basically they are actors and they are athletes. Because story and combat sports meet to make what total divas love to call Broadway with body slams. But that doesn't mean that there's a way to remove the gravity of the falls. And oh my god, the blood part, when people realize that the blood is 99% of the time never fake, it really takes them for a ride. But something beautiful about wrestling is that there is a willing suspension of disbelief that the crowd agrees to, and amidst all the fiction, there's a real, very real sincerity there. Even though they're terrible, I am going to quote quickly the New York Times, this quote that they have about wrestling. There is a story that gets told in wrestling about how things ought to be, It's a story about getting the redemption we feel we deserve. And over the next few episodes, I hope to talk about kayfabe through a set of stories and truths about wrestling. And not to give it all away, but I kind of hope to build up this statue of it. And then in the episodes afterwards, take a sledgehammer to it and break it into a million pieces. Since wrestling so blurs the lines between reality and fiction, it has this very special ability to show us what we want to be real. And I am interested in discovering how we conflate fantasy and reality into this soup that tastes best to us. And when we engage in the stories professional wrestling tells, we begin to be able to play with our imaginations of ourselves. Kayfabe is defined as the fact or convention of presenting staged performances as genuine or authentic. Where it came from is a little bit specious. Some people say the source is from the circus days, and when wrestlers were working in carnivals and circuses, they would speak in a code so the audience wouldn't understand what they were saying. And performers and wrestlers, they would speak this kind of dialect of pig Latin, So people think that this modern interpretation could be of the quote, be fake in pig Latin, but just changing that E to an A sound, kayfabe. And there's no one true etymological source behind the word, but one of the first times the public was made aware of it was in a wrestling newsletter in 1988. 
And before I discuss the ways that kayfabe has transformed and broken down over the years, as I said, I want to build this statue, and I want to talk about what makes us believe in the first place, or an agreed-upon version of believing. In the book Philosophy Smackdown, the author Douglas Edwards discusses a very intro philosophy 101 type of subject that relates to wrestling. Using Plato's allegory of the cave, he talks about how Plato describes the majority of humanity as prisoners locked in a very dark cave and where the only thing they see is shadow puppets on this wall. Prisoners think that what they're seeing is real because it's the only thing they've ever seen, despite the fact that it's a construction by puppet masters or, you know, other the, the powerful people behind the wall. And if one of these prisoners could escape, they'd not only see what they thought was reality, was a construction, but they would also see the true nature of the world. And the author says that the joy of wrestling is that it's like a mini version of Plato's Allegory of the Cave. A wrestling fan enjoys the performance, the construction of reality, and the true nature of the wrestling industry all at the same time. It's a bunch of things coming at you at once. And to move from the abstract into reality, the way that wrestling is staged or choreographed some of the time has not been a secret to fans, really. It's kind of an open secret, if you will. But you would not catch a wrestler acknowledging that side of the business to each other or fans, especially in the early days of wrestling. The first thing was to always protect the business. And because of that, wrestling has its own language, as I said before, the dialect of Pig Latin that influenced what kayfabe is. Uh, And kayfabe itself greatly influences this language. There are kayfabe relationships and marriages, divorces, kayfabe injuries, kayfabe hiring, firing, suspending, and more, all a part of this construction of reality. And modern wrestling fans are very in tune with the jargon that, you know, is within professional wrestling, like heels, faces, a shoot match, or a work. But it wasn't always like that. There are stories of women fans in the 1930s jabbing at the villains with their hairpins. And of course, men fans are known for being brutal throughout the history of the sport, throwing a myriad of objects and stuff. And there is no piece of professional wrestling that has such a strong relationship with kayfabe since the beginning as Mexican wrestling does, Lucha Libre. Luchadors have been popular in Mexico since the 1920s, although they say that the first luchador was in the 1860s. They hide their faces from fans and people in the public, and when they allow you in to see their face, it becomes a thing of respect. The mask acts as a literal barrier from reality. And those masks may have come from something even earlier than wrestling, more battlefield type things. There's a very brief history of Lucha Libre masks, and I know that there are many other people and places that can go deeper into this and give you more detail, which you should look up. It's super fascinating. But... Historians claim that Toltec and Mayan soldiers wore animal masks, like eagles, jaguars, coyotes, when they were fighting against other tribes in order to scare their opponent. And wrestlers kind of took up that notion of resurrecting that past by designing identities that would allow them to fight anonymously and really scare their opponent during the bout. Mascaras masks have an interesting history, and I'm going to try to skip mostly to the person who really popularized the use of masks, and it was El Santo, obviously. He came up in the 1940s. He was known to never, ever, ever remove his mask. Neither his collaborators nor the crew that worked with him knew what he even looked like. And he even had a special mask for eating in front of others that had a really big hole in his mouth that he wouldn't get food on it. And El Santo kind of became a hero in Lucha Libre and in Mexico after his match with Black Shadow, another wrestler, in 1953. And I use this match as an example because 
When Santo unmasked his opponent, Black Shadow, this act in itself forced him to retire from wrestling altogether, because to lose the mask in Lucha Libre is the ultimate defeat. And after his successes, El Santo started a legendary feud with Black Shadow's tag partner at the time, named Blue Demon, and it was that same year. Blue Demon beat him in a couple of matches, and it started a decades-long relationship between the two. They both acted together in a lot of luchador-related cinema, like monster movies and comic books. But even though they teamed up sometime, their rivalry was eternal, mainly because Santo couldn't get let go of this loss that he had experienced to him once. El Santo's longtime friend and a photographer whom I've discussed previously, Lourdes Grobet, confirmed that over their roughly 20 years of friendship, she never saw his or Blue Demon's faces, and she was around their families, in their homes, in many different facets of reality and wrestling. And moving away from the groundwork and the bricks that made up kayfabe so intensely, I want to go to the ways that kayfabe can push the crowd over the edge. There is a power that it holds over a crowd, and you're really at the whim of their fancy. They have the ability to shift your emotions wildly. And one thing kayfabe can do is induce intense anger. In the 1970s, the comedian Andy Kaufman is a good example of where kayfabe can take a crowd. It takes a certain mental energy to wrestle. It takes a certain way of thinking, a certain strategy. Women, I do not think, possess this. I just don't think they do. When it's a woman against a man, the woman does not possess it. The man does. Now, by the same token, there are times when women have more of this mental energy than men. For instance, in the kitchen. Scrubbing the, the potatoes. Washing the carrots. Washing the carrots. Scrubbing the floors. Raising the babies. These are all things that women are good at. He took his love for wrestling, and he took his fame, and he combined them in a fury underneath the bright lights of the ring. He was in a show called Taxi, and it was a big hit. And he had loved wrestling since he was a child, so he had always told people around him he wanted to be a wrestler. And through his comedic talent, he kind of knew how to rile people up, and boy did he do so when he got into the ring. He would wrestle women and dubbed himself the best women's wrestler in the world, the world champion women's wrestler. And through only wrestling women, he really knew how to upset people. He would say things how women only belong in the kitchen, that type of stuff he knew would really rile people up in this time of like the post second wave feminism of the 1970s and late 1960s. And because he was so popular for this in Taxi, of course, that's how he got involved with Jerry Lawler and Memphis Wrestling and how he got on David Letterman with Jerry Lawler. Of course, that infamous video. Jerry Lawler just basically publicly confronted him and was like, well, if you only wrestle women, you, you got to wrestle me to see if you can really do it. And they had a real party with it. Mr. Lawler. I've heard all these things you've been saying about me on television. You want to wrestle me? You want to wrestle me, my Memphis style? All right, fine. I'm not afraid of you, Mr. Lawler, because let me tell you something. True, I only wrestle women, but I've wrestled women that are a lot bigger and stronger than you. Matter of fact, they're probably smarter than you because you don't have any brains. You're from Memphis, Tennessee. All you do is plow the fields and farm and the farm and the uh, But it was all an intense illusion of kayfabe but he would not have let you know that. And to go even further on this dimension, I think about Jim Carrey when he played Andy Kaufman in the movie Man on the Moon. Or sorry, I think it's Man on the Moon. Because during that whole shooting of this film, Jim Carrey was method acting. And I don't think there is a difference between method acting and kayfabe. I really don't, because he pissed everybody off in this. He did not break character throughout the whole entire movie filming. And his kayfabe was so strong that Jerry Lawler, 
who played himself in the movie, was absolutely raging angry at Jim Carrey when he repeatedly told him how he and Andy were actually friends in real life. But Jim Carrey wouldn't believe it, so through, throughout the shooting, he played a bunch of pranks on him and his girlfriend, and Jerry Lawler was not too pleased. Even Jim Carrey couldn't believe this kayfabe that Andy created, I guess, or he was so intense in it. It's like this multi-layer of reality and fiction and reality and fiction, this weird sandwich. Because there is a real precedent to believing, and wrestling was very real to those who watched and who wasn't kind of in on the whole thing or wasn't smarted up like they say in wrestling, wasn't aware of the fictional aspects of it. There's a few examples of times that the audience, it became almost too real, is what I'm trying to say. And this specific one is pretty bad. <laughs> one that became almost too real was after a very horrifyingly bad, tragic turn of, of events. I know I'm laughing, but it's just because I'm nervous. It would lead to Chris Adams, the wrestler, briefly being considered a murder suspect. In the Texas-based promotion WCCW, they did an angle in 1985 that led to Chris Adams being quote-unquote blinded but he, by his former friend and partner Gino Hernandez. But in truth, just Chris was taking some time off, but kayfabe was very well protected in the mid-80s and fans truly believed that Adams had been temporarily blinded by Hernandez. And during his hiatus, it was... Really horrifyingly sad, but Gino tragically passed away due to circumstances that are still kind of undetermined, at least in my research. But I would love if someone had something else to tell me about it. But because of the believability and the like intensity of this angle that was being kind of promoted between Hernandez and Adams on TV, Chris Adams was originally considered a potential suspect in Gino's death. And it was quickly ruled out, thank God. But this is just an incredibly prime example of just how much wrestling blurs the lines between what is real and what is not real. That's how much we can believe. And to take that believing even a step further, there is a certain moment in wrestling history that is very infamous, and people point to it to show just how intensely we can all be a part of the story. And that is when Brian Pillman pulled out a gun. Brian Pillman was known as a very loose cannon. As a wrestler, he was very high-flying, very high-risk, high-reward type of wrestler. And he did some things that had people intensely on the edge. And in one particularly infamous episode of Raw in 1996, in the home of Brian Pillman... He is recovering from a broken leg with an interviewer and the cameras there being broadcasted on Raw. He was in a feud with Steve Austin, who was his one-time friend, and Pillman on camera pulls a gun saying he will shoot him if Austin comes into the Pillman house. And of course, after Austin breaks through the back window, Brian hobbles with his broken leg towards him as his wife screams in terror and raises the gun to Steve Austin. After the screen goes black for a second, it returns to people holding Brian down and the host screaming for someone to call the police. This really fucked people up. Dozens of people called 911, and there was consequences for this. I mean, I bet that they got in trouble with the fucking police department because you're not supposed to take those resources away from others. But it people really, really can believe so intensely that they thought that Brian Pillman really shot this man on live television. And of course, wrestlers didn't just do this for shits and giggles or because of even the tradition. There were sometimes consequences to breaking kayfabe for a while. The promoter of Mid-South Wrestling, Bill Watts, once expressed a very unique of fighting outside of a match in hopes to keep kayfabe alive. He said, quote, I love the tough guys, and I only had two rules. If you got in a fight in my dressing room, we didn't break it up. I wanted to see who could whip whose ass, and then I'd book you a match against each other to see if you wanted to do it again. Second thing, if you got into a fight in public, 
If you lost, you got fired. And apparently he did actually fire Bob Orton Jr. because he had gotten into a fight and I guess his knuckles weren't bruised appropriately. So he assumed that he had lost. So he fired him. Keeping kayfabe was incredibly important to promoters and they wanted the fantasy that was conjured in the squared circle to seep out over into the lines of reality and they did not want this to be broken and it was so intense. And I have to say, there are so many other instances that made people believe to their hearts, to their feet. They believed it ten toes down and and knew that they had to protect these people that they cared so much about and hurt these others that wanted to fuck them up. Because although I'm getting to the end of this first section, I have to say that there's just so many more and if people want me to cover more instances that really built this statue of kayfabe, I would love to. Because before I get to the end of what really destroyed it, officially, or kind of officially, social media has really shifted kayfabe. And there are a few people who still maintain it and hold it up. And of course, some of those are luchadors. Luchadors still wear masks. I mean, well, some of them do, some of them don't. But that tradition has remained very true. And, you know, there's photos of Rey Mysterio online. You can see his face. But there are so few photos of him. And they're mostly from when he didn't wear a mask in the ring. And now he wouldn't be outside, you know, as a wrestler without it. Because it's so important and the tradition remains so true. But there are other people who also maintain kayfabe. And one of them is, of course... MJF of AEW. I have a couple things I need to say. Uh, I got Purell on hand because everybody here are disgusting, knuckle-dragging, mouth-breathing, inbred morons. And uh, I literally cannot wait to get the... F Maxwell Jacob Friedman kind of blurs this line between who his character is and who he is so intensely that really nobody knows if it is actually him. He, you know, throws drinks in kids' faces and he says, fuck them kids on, you know, a, sta a stage hit to thousands. And he really has all the interest in being what a heel is and he really keeps kayfabe alive. Another person who does this in the same company, AEW, is the wrestler Abaddon. And her opponent from the Black Hills. Abaddon! Abaddon is this demonic punk presence that crawls on all fours to get into the ring. And they have maintained this presence of otherworldliness in and outside of the ring, including on, you know, Instagram and in these social media spheres that promote you to be yourself. They have just continued their thing. And I think it was only... A couple of months ago that Abaddon spoke for the first time in front of a bunch of people and people were like, holy shit, that's what their voice sounds like? That's crazy. That's how deep that character is for them. And while there are still some other people who maintain kayfabe, I am going to say one last thing about one of the moments that kayfabe was abandoned for money. And I think you might know what I'm talking about. In 1989, when Vince McMahon Jr. publicly came out, he's to not that he was gay, I wish, he came out to say that wrestling was not a sport to New Jersey State Senate. His admission was to avoid interference from the state athletic commissions and to try avoid paying taxes in the states where his events were held. Another reason he did it was to avoid the requirement of having to pay and employ medical professionals that would stand by for his wrestlers, as was generally mandatory for legitimate contact sports. He completely fucked the business that his dad built up from the ground and many other people, not just him, but just for money. And it is a very sad thing that I don't think, I think many people are turning over in their graves if they had known about it. But still, even after doing it, 
McMahon became a character that was like anti-union, a piece of slime boss who took advantage of the people that worked for him. So it really like fed into the kayfabe even further. You know, it's this really weird kind of dance between the two for him. And because of this, this era of professional wrestling since then has been described as neo-kayfabe, in which storylines can become real life and vice versa. It blurs the distinction between fact and fiction, and it gives the audience complicity in creating this spectacle, more so than it did used to, you know? And this is where I'm going to stop, but in future episodes... I would like to do an episode on infamous moments that broke kayfabe as we knew it in half, and what kayfabe is now. When reality is broken and rebuilt and broken and rebuilt again, narratives and stories are proven as so important. Then after I get through some that broke it in half, I want to get into something that fans are still confused about, and that is... The screw jobs of wrestling, the Montreal screw job, the two original screw jobs with Wendy Richter and George Hackenschmidt. I'm going to get into that afterwards, and that episode will be called Wrestling's Screw Jobs. And I hope that you enjoyed listening and that this wasn't too weird or anything. It's kind of a train of thought, a very long one, but I hope that you enjoyed, and I would hope if you would join me again. Thank you so much for listening. Wrestling Wench is written, created, and produced by me, Alexa Pruitt. The music is by Kreider Dane of Helter Skelter Music Productions. And if you enjoyed what you hear, please come back. Thanks so much.